Good afternoon. My name is Michael Epp. I'm a CPA practicing in Edmonton, Alberta, and originally from Saskatchewan. Business owners need advice. Their world is complicated and demanding. Our role as advisors is to guide them through the normal business challenges and sometimes chaotic situations they all face. Advisors first develop their expertise, practice it for their career, then seek an exit strategy. Advisors are used to building and maintaining relationships. When they see that the end of their career is near, they think about transitioning. Ultimately, their goal is to transition these relationships, allowing another advisor to take over. About 15 years ago, I became involved with my first transition. A friend of mine asked me to take over his practice thereby allowing he and his wife to retire. As we lived in the same neighborhood and attended the same community functions, his plan became a topic of conversation. When he told me he was ready to step away, I told him, I told him I was ready to jump into his shoes. And that started the ball rolling. Since that first transition, our firm has orchestrated close to a dozen of these arrangements. I've been privileged to be a part of many of them. Today I want to share my experiences and what I've learned. I've always had a yearning to build business. This was initially inspired by my parents. My dad was in the trucking business in Saskatchewan. Whenever he saw another company's load going down the highway, he said to my mom, that load should have been mine. A practice advisor at CPA Alberta told me to be patient. He cautioned me to develop my accounting skills first, build my public practice knowledge base, and only then embark on the adventures of transitioning a practice. The operations of an advisory practice are well-defined. We've all developed our knowledge base, we've practiced our skills, and developed wonderful relationships with our clients. Stepping into the shoes of another successful advisor is a real challenge. Let me share with you the approaches I've taken over the years and what I've learned. The approaches to orchestrating a transition will vary. I have found that when a CPA reaches out to us, the result is a more satisfying dynamic through the whole process. Initially, gut feel and first impressions are important. In one situation, after a two hour initial meeting, I said to the two partners that had approached me, I can't see how this transition wouldn't work. This initial visit led to a completed transition. In one unique situation, CP Alberta reached out to us. They asked if we'd be interested in helping out a member. This member was seriously ill. We did a preliminary investigation and decided to assist this member. It just seemed like the right thing to do. I've read many books and attended succession planning PD courses. They helped me in developing my approach. For one such course, the presenter was Stephen McIntyre Smith, author of a CPA Canada publication, Succession Planning Toolkit. The fellow I sat next to had recently approached me. We had met in his office in a rural Alberta community to discuss a possible transition. Quite a coincidence. We never completed the transition, However, the fact that I can remember many details of that day shows my degree of excitement with this process. Of course, I'm always hopeful these initial meetings lead to a transition. Another author, Mort Shapiro, wrote Merging of Professional Practices. I closely followed his recommended approaches. Another firm, Poe Group Advisors, Brannon Poe, authored a book Accountants Flight Plan, Practices for Today's Firms. Accountants Flight Plan, Best Practices for Today's Firms. These advisors actually brokered one of these transitions as they are active in Canada. Recently, a Calgary CPA has set up an advisory services business to assist in arranging transitions. In 2018, we rebranded and updated our website. It now includes our interest in succession planning and our willingness to assist retiring practitioners. Much is accomplished even during that first phone call. 
we explore big picture objectives, then agree to meet face to face for the initial discussion and get down to details. There is always something to learn, even if the transition doesn't happen. These initial meetings last a couple of hours. My meeting notes generally become the backbone of the agreement. For the rural CPAs, I always travel to their communities. It made sense for me to meet the retiring CPA on their own turf. This also gave me a chance to drive around and visualize our firm as becoming part of the business community. After these initial meetings, we often enjoyed a meal, a relaxing way to end the visit, allowing for easy sharing of firm history and our personal lives. We'll ask about community activities, ways to promote our firm, and the unique aspects of their community and its history. Developing local leadership has always been our long-term vision. A local office manager, combined with scheduled weekly visits by Edmonton professionals, is the way we've operated. In fact, a planned transition failed because we weren't able to identify the local office manager. I've been asked if I was going to move to the community. I respond, no, our plan is to develop local leadership. This answer seems to satisfy client concerns. 15 years ago, when we ventured into this succession planning business, the concept was newer and we did get some pushback. I still get some ribbing from the local CPA firms. They'll advertise locally owned. When people ask me what keeps me awake at night, I would have to say it's the uncertainty of developing local leadership in a smaller community. However, we've had success and I remind myself of this. For example, we've been successfully grooming a couple of young CPAs that are now working toward management roles in these smaller communities. During the initial meeting, we'll discuss the nature and makeup of the fee base. For example, what is the age range of private company clients? What is the age range of personal tax clients? What are your billing rates? What is your average billing for particular service categories? I want to know how staff will receive us. Staff support also enhances client support. As expected, clients like to work with staff that are familiar with their business. In one instance, we invited staff from a firm that had successfully transitioned to meet with staff from a newly transitioning firm. This meeting helped to dispel their concerns. I expected that purchase price would be top of mind for both parties. As it turned out, it seems to be one of the last topics discussed. I relied on books, PD courses, internet searches, and discussions with more experienced CPAs to give me the basic structures of the deal. I became more knowledgeable with each transition. As is usually the case, there is a general rule of thumb for valuing CPA practice. The range is still 80 to 120% of recurring fees. Each party has to feel comfortable with the price, otherwise relationship building will fall apart. The last discussion point is usually the effective date of a potential transaction. CPAs reaching out to us commonly do this in May after tax season and before the busy June 30th corporate filing deadlines. The next logical time for the process to begin would be September. A November 1 or December 1 effective date is not unrealistic for either a May or September initial phone call. This allows the new CPA to get familiar with practice operations, clients, staff, the community, before things get busy again in January. Of course, there are always exceptions. We've also used effective dates of July 1 and January 1. Enough information is shared at the time of the initial meeting to allow for a go, no go decision. It is important to have these decision points at key times in the negotiations. From a relationship standpoint, it is never good to lead anyone along. One never wants to burn bridges. One transition plan failed when the retiring CPA wasn't happy with one clause in our firm's partnership agreement. This individual was going to become a partner and hold that position for a period of time, and then retire, leaving us his practice. 
There had been many meetings and much information provided when everything came to a halt. The particular issue couldn't be resolved. The negotiations ended. The next step is for the retiring CPA to assemble all the requested information. This allows for detailed analysis. Now the retiring CPA and new CPA are working as a team. The culmination of this analysis, including multiple additional meetings or phone calls, should allow us to prepare the letter of intent or LOI. Although not legally binding, a signed LOI gives the green light to appointing a lawyer to draft the legal agreement. A phrase I use sometimes is the paralysis of analysis. Accountants, by their nature, can suffer from this. If the parties can't get to a signed LOI, the negotiation will end. This is a time for flexibility, understanding, and being supportive of the overall objective. The legal agreement doesn't have to be an arduous process. For example, complexity usually comes from the treatment of subjective elements like valuing of work in progress. The retiring CPA should bill all work in progress and be able to offer a clean slate to the new CPA. We've used the same lawyer for most of our agreements. Both parties should get independent legal advice. I'll have to admit, it takes me several readings of the agreement to really understand it and ensure that it meets the spirit of the arrangement. It's times like this I remind myself that I'm only an accountant. The best agreement comes from a clear letter of intent coupled with lots of open and transparent discussion. The development of all the new relationships is the most challenging and most rewarding part of this whole process. While completing my first transition and assuming responsibility for the new clients and staff, I began to realize this. It was a conscious awakening. The retiring CPA needs to introduce our firm to the clients. This is done through phone calls, personal letters, arranging face-to-face -face meetings, and perhaps holding client receptions. The form of communication is generally dependent on the size of client and frequency of communication. For example, personal tax clients are usually sent letters. Corporate clients are either phoned or introductory meetings arranged. The prime goal is to ensure clients are informed of the reasoning for the change and to introduce the new firm. We help the retiring CPA develop the communications. Our insights are always appreciated this may be the first time a retiring CPA informs clients of their decision to retire. In our experience, retiring CPAs have at least spoken with clients about their time frame for leaving their practice. As such, the official communication may only be a confirmation of earlier client discussions. However, for the first time, the client is introduced to the new firm and partner. The effective date for our most recent transition occurred on January 1, 2020. Initial communication with our new clients during COVID protocols was a challenge. I was amazed at the sensitivity displayed by these clients. They knew it was tough for us. We knew it was tough for them. We experienced many open and cordial discussions during this time. Phone calls ended with, take care, stay safe. One cannot overemphasize the value of a good departure and a welcoming arrival. A positive experience for the new client delivers untold benefits. Client retention is enhanced through these early processes. The communications to clients also serves to inform of unique circumstances. For example, a transition from a sole practitioner to the new CPA, being a member of a partnership, requires clarification. This represents a different dynamic. The client has been dealing with the CPA personally. Now, with a larger firm, there will likely be two or three people that will contact and interact with the client during the course of an engagement. That will be a new experience for the clients. As such, they should be informed in advance so they know what to expect. We've encouraged retiring CPAs to inform their clients and focus on the benefits. We have experienced some loss of clients because of this changing dynamic. Some are uncomfortable with the idea of a larger firm. The vast majority accept the new reality 
end time, the vast majority accept their new reality and in time realize there can be a benefit. Of course, the mandate for any size of firm is to deliver personalized services to all clients. Satisfaction surveys say the most important concern for clients is, does my CPA care about me? Interestingly, fees charged seems never to be the key issue. A successful first year engagement is so important in the transition process. As we all know, one cannot overemphasize the importance of making a good first impression. In my experience, there have been some oversights, despite our best efforts. In a recent transition, there were two clients with identical husband and wife names. It resulted in a mix-up when we invoiced. It was embarrassing, but we sorted it out with only a chuckle. Constant dedication to a successful first engagement keeps these incidents to a minimum. It is inevitable that we'll be compared to the former CPA. As is the case with any new client, we need to gain sufficient knowledge of business in order to properly serve. After so many years, a practitioner has a fund of knowledge to share with the new CPA. The current and permanent files will provide much of this information. In the agreement, we include a clause that specifies the amount of time we need with the retiring CPA for this debriefing. It's typically two or three hours, depending on the client complexity. This allows for discussion of the unique circumstances of the client. We need to know this information before we can effectively serve. People have unique interests and personalities. For example, who is in charge of the financial affairs of the business? Is this information shared freely between husbands and wives and other shareholders? Financial issues can impact personal relationships. We observe the dynamics of this during client meetings. It's good to know as much as possible before our first meeting. There can be tensions between the couple. Just this week, one client spouse said, I'm not doing the bookkeeping anymore. We were able to provide an alternative strategy that saved the day. There are stresses in any relationship. Working together in a family business is great, but it requires much discussion, understanding, and transparency. Often the CPA is a sounding board for the couple and can offer alternative courses of action to sort out issues. We need to be sensitive to these pressure points. The more we know about a new client, the better chance we have of satisfying their needs and by doing so, make that all important good first impression. There are normal deliverables associated with any engagement. Suggesting significant changes to the format should be handled carefully. I have learned this the hard way. I have to remind myself that client CPA relationships have been a success for many years. Clients likely don't know there are alternative presentation models. Wholesale changes may confuse and aggravate. If there are material errors or obvious inconsistencies, changes need to be made. As a courtesy to the retiring CPA, we need to communicate our suggested changes before talking with a the client. There have definitely been times when I was too enthusiastic to make things right, only to find out later that I really didn't understand the facts. Criticism can be a barrier to effective communication and aggravates the relationship. Open and honest communication between the two CPAs allows for proper strategies. Don't hesitate to apologize if you've jumped ahead of yourself. In a few situations, I inadvertently damaged a potential new client relationship that I could not recover from. Those were hard lessons. Often the client or retiring CPA will acknowledge they too have made mistakes. We learn from our mistakes. No one is perfect. These transition arrangements will often lead to a need for navigating uncharted waters. This should never discourage a CPA from working through a transition arrangement. There is so much to learn, resulting in so many opportunities to expand our horizons. We need to remember the client has been working with a retiring CPA for many years. For example, the partners of a recent transition had been together for 30 to 40 years. In a number of instances, their clients, first generation business owners, had already turned the business over to the second generation. The partners helped us identify suitable staffing for their clients, recognizing that clients tend to want to interact 
with similar aged CPAs. In our firm, we generally have a partner-manager pairing for each client. This gives us the opportunity to match the generations. This particular transition to our firm worked very well as the clients knew much about us. The transitioning firm had shared office space with us for about a year. As such, their clients were already familiar with our office. We need also to determine the manner in which their CPA reviewed and interpreted their financial information. All CPAs have their own favorite way of reviewing financial information and tax returns. It is best to take extra time to fully understand what the client is used to before making changes. Again, we don't want to surprise our new clients. In one transition arrangement, we discovered that client reports were generally sent by email with follow-up phone calls. As the clients were new to us, we wanted to conduct face-to-face -face meetings as a way of getting to know them. Given the nature of their industry, it was hard for clients to come in for meetings during office hours. We began offering the option of face-to-face -face meetings. A new CPA may come across potential special projects. We need to be tactful when discussing these opportunities. It is best to first discuss these special service opportunities with the retiring CPA. A common response I've heard, both from the client and the retiring CPA is, yes, we've discussed this before, now might be a good time to act on it. When staff transition to our firm, formal interviews are conducted as a means of introducing our firm and getting to know our new employees. Employment contracts are presented for signing, just as though the employees had applied for a new position. We have always committed to the departing CPA that we will hire existing staff. Maintaining staffing has always helped in, ex in maintaining staffing has always helped in easing the transition of client relationships. Often, the concern for prospective clients is, will Mary still be working on my file? In fact, I have also heard, I don't know who Mike is, but as long as Mary is still being assigned to my file, I'm fine with the transition. There is another key relationship, that of the CPA and his or her spouse. As a couple, they are making their way into retirement, a totally new experience. It is gratifying to see their anticipation for rest and relaxation after years of service. Buying a motorhome or a truck and trailer and heading for the open road seems to be a common desire for retiring accountants in Alberta. I think one CPA had his motorhome in the parking lot with the engine running and ready for the open road. That was the day we signed. Another CPA and his wife, after finalizing our agreement, left us the keys for the office and headed for the airport. They were embarking on language training associated with a voluntary service adventure. Another time, the partners headed out on cruises shortly after the closing date. In all cases, it has been great to witness their excitement and to hear about their adventures. In one of our offices, a staff golf tournament is held annually. We invited one of the retiring partners. He brought his wife. I recall standing back from the group and observing the fun everybody was having. I particularly noticed the partner and his wife having such a good visit with their former employees. Perhaps that was one of those paradigm shifts when I realized it's never about the money. There is so much good in maintaining relationships and making new ones. We become competitors with other CPA firms particularly in rural communities. We need to consider our relationship with other practitioners. In one situation, we visited with a local partner on one of these firms, letting him know that a transition was going to be soon announced. I have always said there is plenty of work for all of us. We have coexisted in this community now for 10 years, never stepping on each other's toes. In closing, I would like to say that it's been a privilege for me to be involved with these retiring CPAs. Transitioning all these relationships has been very important to me. This transitioning has become a fabric of our firm. Sustaining these CPA practices has given my partners and I a real sense of satisfaction. Combining organic growth with growth through transitioning has opened up our firm to many new experiences and opportunities. I hope this is the way of the future for all advisors to the private business sector. We're well aware 
of the importance of this sector to the overall Canadian business environment. Thank you for listening. I am looking forward to your questions and comments. Are you an advisor in the agriculture industry? At Welltrax, we understand the importance of surface lease income for many of your farm clients. With leading technology and over 30 years of experience, we're here to help, providing the most accurate accounting of oil and gas assets available. Rely on Welltrax for the information you need in annual tax planning, farm succession, or farm sale. Contact Welltracks and get well connected today.